Why do you say that, Father? You aren't afraid, are you? No. But I respect some of the superstitions of others. Often, they are founded in fact. Broadcasting from our Sanctum Sanctorum in Venice, California, this is the Sixth Sense Society. I'm your host, Krista, here with our producer, Michael, and today we are talking to Hollywood stuntman, Hall of Famer, Peter Kent, who is Arnold Schwarzenegger's stunt double for 14 years. And today our topic is going to be cheating death. But before we get started, Michael has a few announcements. Hey, everybody, and welcome to our show. Um, Peter's been a good friend of mine for an awful long time, and I'm so excited to have him here on the show with us. It's going to be an awful lot of fun. Um, we have some great shows coming up, and next week in particular, we have a new friend, Emma Thorne, from London, England, and she is a practicing atheistic Satanist, and we're going to be looking at the path of Satanism and what drew her to that path. And for me, this is an important show because one of the, the mission statements we have for Sixth Sense Society is tolerance, and we really want to understand everyone's point of view and belief. And so we really want to delve into all kinds of different spiritual paths, including some that are very non-traditional. And so to, to talk to someone who we may have faults beliefs about and find out what they really believe and practice. I think this is a, just an important part of who we are. So please join us for that one. Um, you can get all the information on our uh, website, sixcentsociety.com, S-I-X-T-H, all spelled out. And you can sign up for our newsletter and buy us a coffee on Ko-Fi if you can and so forth when you're there. Um, and you'll find announcements for what's coming up and all that good stuff. So I don't want to take too much time because we are uh, got a lot of ground to cover. So I'm going to kick it back to you, Krista. So take it away, Krista. Great. Thanks, Michael. And welcome, Peter. Hey, how are you guys? Good to see you. Good to see you as always. It's been a while. Yes, it has. We've known you for many years now, though. I think it probably getting close to maybe 30 almost. Yeah, yeah. I think you, you met Michael first at the um, Venice Beach when he was doing readings there. Yeah, I saw his, uh, his Nova Scotia flag and, and my family had history in Nova Scotia. And then he also had a Welsh flag up and that's part of my heritage. So I was kind of drawn to that right away. And you grew up in British, British Columbia, correct? I did um, most of my life. And then also my mom moved to uh, New Jersey in the U.S. for uh, I was there for about five years. And then, um, yeah, came back here and then went, moved to L.A. and spent uh, 16 years there. That's right. Work, working for a guy named Arnold. <laughs> exactly. Well, tell us how you got connected to the stunt work. Well, obviously, uh, it was one of those twists of fate, really, because I had no, I went to LA on a whim. Uh, the economy was pretty bad here. And, and uh, I arrived on uh, November 24th, I, I believe it was 1983, because I remember that it was uh, Thanksgiving. And I got off the bus on Hollywood Boulevard at the um, Hollywood Roosevelt. <clears throat> that 50 bucks a night, it was pretty rich for my blood, but I needed a place to stay. And uh, then I moved down the street and stayed in the YMCA. And I went to, to look through all the casting agencies because I thought, well, I had been an actor doing theater and I was going to make myself famous <laughs> in Hollywood, which is about the naivest thing you can possibly think of. But uh, I sent out some photos to a very small casting agency who in turn called me and said, by the way, we're casting this little movie called The Terminator. And... Um, Jim Cameron has seen your picture and he would like to see you. And it was right down the street for me at that point. It was at the ABC uh, television center on Romaine. So I literally walked two blocks down the street, met James Cameron, took one look at me and uh, we got, we hit it off pretty well because we we're both Canadian and he hired me at 40 bucks a day flat <laughs> to work on the Terminator. Standing in for Arnold was the original concept. Uh, but uh, as soon as he got me on the set and dressed me in the clothes, he's like, well, you can do stunts too. I'm like, uh, and, and he, in fact, asked me, he said, have you ever done stunts before? And as I was going out the door, literally be, having been hired already as the stand in. And I looked at him and I thought to myself, I better say yes to this because I might not have the other job. Uh, and so I said yes. And <laughs> there we were. We went to uh, 15 films, 14 films with Arnold over 15 years. 
That's amazing. And I mean, that's um, youth for you. It's so innocent and trusting and willing to kind of jump over the cliff without even knowing that you're actually jumping over the cliff by saying what you were saying. Well, the funny part of it is I really didn't know what stunts was at that point. Um, and the thing was, I, I don't know how Jim actually bought what I said because I said yes. But in 19, you know, 83, 82, there wasn't much of a film industry in Vancouver to speak of. And I don't know that there was a lot of stunt guys around there. So where my experience might have come from is anybody's guess. Uh, but nonetheless, he said yes and signed me up. And fortunately, I got put into it on a very kind of slow, measured pace until uh, the first gag that I was asked to do, which was to go backwards through a plate glass window. And I, I kind of looked a bit mystified and shocked at that one. But, uh, you know. I just went along with it. So was it mostly training on the job then? Yes, not highly recommended when it comes to stunts. <laughs> well, during that period, do you, do you think it was also a different world for stunt people as far as training and pr preparation compared to now? Yeah, I think so. There was a lot of, um, a lot more kind of seat of the pants attitude about it. I mean, you know, you look back at the early cowboys, right? The early cowboys that were the stunt guys in all the old Western movies with John Wayne and Yakima Kanut, who's the grandfather of all stunt men, John Wayne's double. Um, those guys, you know, literally they started out doing crazy stuff like, you know, real fist fights on camera, um, just, you know, to, to sell it. And then, you know, they looked at the footage and went, maybe we can do this by just missing the face instead of actually you know, making the connection. Um, so there was a lot more, it was a lot more loose and not as stringent with, especially with respect to safety. Um, so we've come a long way in that, uh, you know, just the, and the gear too, the protection. I mean, back in those days, they didn't wear anything. You took a fall off a horse dressed as a first nations guy with a wig with braids on it. You know, these were generally all white guys and they just crashed into the rocks on the ground and got up and went for it again. Wow. So were you kind of uh, athletic before that? Did you like um, sort of daredevil things in general, or was that just something that developed? Um, I was in, into track and field in school. Um, I guess the daredevil part, you could, you could say that. I think crazy is, is probably <laughs> a better adjective. Um, so yeah, I guess yes. So were yeah. you even as a little boy, did you do things that your mother was uh, nervous about? You know, some... Some kids really will climb trees and just are. Yes, I was the master tree climber. Yeah, I grew up in North Vancouver and uh, on our property, we had a lot of, you know, 80 to 100 foot uh, cedar trees. And so what I would do is my mom would be in the kitchen, you know, making supper or making lunch or whatever. And I would call her and she would come out and I'd be mom, mom. And she'd come out, look, you know, wiping her hands on her apron, looking for me. And I'd be at the very top of this tree where it was about that big around holding on to the thing and swinging it back and forth, you know, 30 foot swings. And she'd just like scream. And, you know, I would sometimes even just let go and fall through the branches to the ground <laughs> and get all scraped up. And yeah. So. Ah, yeah. you see a stunt man in the making. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so Without even knowing it. So when you, when was your first time that you had any kind of uh, difficulty with the stunt or any sort of negative uh, repercussions with the stunt? Um, well, not, I mean, I, I was fairly lucky to have been schooled by some legendary stunt guys like Frank Orsati, who was on uh, the first Terminator. And um, subsequently after that, the other guys that I worked with, they kind of brought me along. Uh, to, I think, as Frank said to me on the first Terminator, he goes, I better help you out because I can't have you getting killed on my watch. <laughs> so... I think that, um, I mean, I was fortunate in having him and, and I think subsequently the other guys who kind of brought me along as well, realizing that uh, the director wanted me to do them because of the fact that I looked like Arnold. So when the director wants something, you sort of have to facilitate it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I had that advantage. And then, of course, I developed a relationship with Arnold. Mm -hmm. And so once that went forward, uh, we got to a point where he would request me. Wow. And so, you know, you, I was lucky in that because that's that that bond right there is what, you know, helps you make money. It keeps you working on every show with your with your actor. And, uh, you know, you get the personal treatment out of that, too, as well. So that was a big plus. That's amazing. Uh, now, one of the reasons Michael really wanted you to come on the show was because he thought that being a stuntman and you having some real, real close calls that. You must have thought about death more than the average person. And um, 
the whole concept of of cheating death in in that maybe you you were kind of cheating death with some of the near death experiences that you had. Uh, so let's sort of dive into that topic a little bit. Okay. Well, funny or not so funny. Uh, when I was young, uh, I'm talking 17, 18, I was in a bad car accident where I was DOA. Uh, and I went from the back seat of a 1966 Buick Wildcat through the windshield and into the long grass um, down the road in the dark. It was like five o'clock in the morning. And so I wasn't discovered until later on. And, um, you know, I, I had flatlined at that point and they started me up again. So that was pretty much my first experience. And um, if the question, if the next question from you is, did you see the light or any of that? I didn't see any of that. Um, I wish I had, because it might have been, you know, one of those defining moments. Um, so that was basically my first experience with cheating death, per se. Um, and I had another car accident after that, and then a motorcycle accident after that. Uh, none quite as severe as the first one. But, um, you know, I think if you want to, if, if I need to put check marks for each time that I sort of may have cheated it, I think there'd probably be quite a number of them. Um, and so, I'm, for, for one thing, I really don't have a big fear of dying. I mean, I have kids and stuff that I would like to stick around for. But I think after that point, I've sort of lost that, that fear of it. Um, so when we got into uh, the movies, for instance, uh, Terminator 2, as you can see this scene, and I chose this, oh, wrong finger. <laughs> I'm trying to point that, there, that one right there. Um, that scene with me on the truck. So this was a gag that we wanted to do, but we had never had a chance to actually test it until the night we were supposed to do it. And, uh, you know, we, the, we had the big truck here, the rig, pushing the small truck from behind, and I had to get out of the door, run across the bed of the little pickup truck onto the hood, blow the windshield out, and, you know, throw the gun and jump to the side mirror. Um, we had never done it before. When we first tried it, uh, literally, we had to be doing 60 miles an hour because the shimmy between the two trucks, the truck pushing the smaller one, made it, uh, made it impossible for me to cross the bed of the little truck without being flung out. Um, and so once we got up to 60, you know, there was no way to put a cable on me because if I fell, I would have just been swung back underneath the big rigs tires. Uh, and so my option was basically, you know, if at 60, if I fall, I'm just going to try and kick off, hope I don't hit my head. And, and if I make it, <clears throat> so we set it up, we got it balanced and ready to go after a couple of rehearsals, just small ones. And then Jim said, okay, do you want to get up there and do it? And the first one, I kind of sat there and it was about 5 a.m. And I thought to myself, you know, there's a very real chance that I might not make it through this. And it was the very first time I'd ever really thought of that. Um, and I kind of thought about my mom back home in Canada. And I thought, you know, maybe I don't get to see you again. And I kind of just said to her, you know, I love you and that kind of thing. And, um, and then I just went for it. And actually, Jim said, OK, let's try it the first time. And we got it. It was a little bit rugged and not quite as polished as what ended up on film. And then Jim said, okay, well, let's take a break for lunch and come back. And I said, um, I can't eat. I said, my guts, are, I'm full of butterflies. I said, my, my guts, there's no way. Can we do this now? And Jim said, well, he looked at me for a second. He goes, okay, you know what? You pull this off, I'll give you the Brass Balls Award. And then he turned to the crew and he said, we're going to call Grace, which means we're going to suspend lunch, which for 300 people probably cost, you know, at that back in those days, probably cost him 25 grand. Uh, and so we could get the shot and we did it in three takes. Um, and you know, the first time, I, the first two times, in fact, I jackrabbited across the bed of that small truck so quick, Jim was like, can you slow it down? I said, <laughs> I'm not staying in the kill zone. So if you want to slow it down, why don't you do that in post? Mm. And, and the funny part was that later on when they did the video of the making of T2, uh, they did the DVD release and there was a section in there about the making of and the behind the scenes of the stunts. This was probably two years later. Jim said, I would never do that gag for real. Never again. He goes, it was far too dangerous. Peter could have been killed. Wow. You know, <laughs> two years after the fact, and I'm seeing that, I'm going, you know, thanks, Jim. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> so I was wondering if you ever got nervous because the stunts are so over the top, some of the ones that you've done, and, and I could see why they would say that now. Yeah, well, you know, and the funny thing is then, then versus now, is that a lot of the stuff now is not practical. Like this is practical, what you're seeing behind me. Um, we have a, a real truck on a real street, 
me running across it, no wires, no nothing. And nowadays stuff is done on green screen where the guy's on a big green box where they, you know, or they CG in the truck or he's on a, he's on a big massive green screen stage with wires on and all of that stuff. So, I mean, and you look at those movies and you get that aspect of watching a video game. Mm -hmm. Whereas the, the viscerality of this, when you see the actual guy on the truck, knowing that, you know, he has a lot, every likelihood if he fell, he'd be killed. Of course, he's the Terminator, so. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it, it just it speaks volumes about the films that we made back then. It's cheaper and safer now to do it on a green screen stage, but it doesn't look the same. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point, actually. Did you ever want to stop before you did stop? I mean, was there any time where you thought you'd done enough? Because you were, you were doing stunts for longer than a lot of people, it sounds like. Well, the average, I think, for the average stunt person tends to run it for about seven years or so, and then they quit and they become a coordinator or a, or a second unit director, which I have done as well. But back in the day, um, I just like the idea of being able to zip my bag up and just go home and not have to go and make a bunch of phone calls and, you know, order people up for the next day and all of that stuff. I just wanted to walk away and so lick my wounds and be done for the day. Um, so I just kept doing it and when you know, Arnold kept working. And so I would just keep getting the call. Yeah, Peter, come out now. We're going to work. We got a movie to do. <laughs> and, and so I would be there for those. Um, so subsequently, uh, when we did True Lies, there's a shot of me taking a running dive on the dock when the fuel truck explodes behind me. Um, and if you watch that, I actually have the freeze frame of it. And in the air behind me, in the, in the blast, I'm sort of suspended in the air going into the water. And in the air behind me, in the blast, you can see this black shape. So that frame that I have of that is something that Jim Cameron sent me uh, from uh, the edit bay. He actually called me up and he said, I'm cutting right now. Do you want to see how close you came to dying? <laughs> and I was like, uh, well, oh, I guess so. And um, so he sent me that frame. And what happened was when the, there was a, a truck actually cut apart with a cutting torch and then tacked back together again. So it was a one take deal with nine cameras. So if I didn't get it right, we would have lost the truck and the shot would have had to have been done somewhere else, some other way. So it had to be perfect. Um, but what happened is as I was in midair in the dive, the explosion chunks of the steel from the truck, some of them as big as a, you know, the hood of a truck or the hood of a car, uh, one of them was coming right at the back of my head and literally probably would have severed my head, oh. uh, except the heat, the heat from the blast, the explosion behind me picked that up and lifted it away. And so uh, I didn't see it, you know, had it hit me, I would never have known, I would have just hit the water dead. Um, but Jim was like, yeah, he goes, all of a sudden it just got picked up and moved away. And if you watch that sequence in the film, you can see it if you freeze frame through the DVD, you can see what's happening there. Wow. So that was another near death experience. And that, that one's interesting, too, because you personally didn't know you were so near death. No. But you, had, you saw but, the evidence of it afterwards. But, you know, I think there's a lot to be said for that, that statement you just made. I think a lot of people, you know, one minute or one second, either way, he, he goes to step off the curb uh, and someone calls him or he hears a noise behind him and doesn't step off. And a car, you know, hits another car and, and fl goes through the space where one second ago he might have been standing. Right. You know, or, or, you know, he runs across the intersection uh, and, you know, and gets a near miss or he runs across the intersection too slow and goes underneath the car. I mean, those, it's that, what do you want to call it? Twist of fate, the, the minutia of minutes, so just, you know, what is it really? Um, that, that, um, whereas sometimes you make it and sometimes you don't, and you don't know, right. You, you don't know that you miss death by a fraction. Right. Michael, you have a comment. Yeah. I was just going to mention, you know, when you talk about the door being lifted up and so forth, um, do you believe personally that you have sort of a guardian angel that's kind of watching you over you in those moments trying to say, and I'm assuming yours has to be a raging alcoholic at this point, I would think, but, <laughs> but, but again, you know, is, is it that divine intervention that kind of lifts that door? A guardian angel with his hand across his face like this, just like, you know, oh no, not again. <laughs> exactly. Um, but again, I kind of feel that way. Yeah. And again, is that, is that something that, you know, is there that divine intervention? It just isn't your time. And, and that divine intervention just kind of lifts that door at the last second. Well, and I'll tell you what, I have a bit of a belief about that because, um, you know, uh, I have two twin boys now 
And uh, I feel that they are literally my reason for living, my family. And uh, I think back to all the times that I've narrowly missed dying. And I think, well, then, and I, and I have thought of this many times. I'm like, well, why am I here? And then I see them. And that becomes quite clear to me why I'm here. And I have the feeling that I'm, my preservation is somehow tied to them. And whether I'm right or wrong, I, I feel very strongly about that because of all the stuff that I've managed to avoid and all the times I've managed to survive, um, you know, moments that I didn't know and or did. Um, and, uh, you know, I look at those boys and I'm like, well, I'm here for them. And, and so it just makes my responsibility to them feel even stronger. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Uh, I, um, now I read a book by Robert Moss, who's really into dreams and all kinds of dreams, shamanistic dreams, and uh, not so much to psychological. And he's kind of well known for that. And in this one uh, section, there was a woman that was uh, very ill in real life. And um, she was, I think, going to die even. And she had this dream that she met death at the top of the hill and death had this contract and said, you know, like it's your time. Right. And she said in the dream, she renegotiated the contract because she had, she wanted to live for some other people. She had some right. other family members and she felt she didn't want to let them down. And, and so she woke up and she actually got better. And I was thought, wow, that's really amazing. I mean, that idea of, of living for a specific reason, but also in her case, actually renegotiating a time where she could have died. Yeah. Well, I, if anybody renegotiated for me, it must've been my guardian angels, but I think I've probably gone through a few of them. They probably, like Mike says, they're probably in some insane asylum <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> or well, been recycled or, or who knows where they've ended up. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I just feel incredibly lucky and, and I wake up every morning realizing to myself and I do that I shouldn't be here. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, I mean, DOA early on is, is one thing, but then this litany of other chances where, uh, I could have been snatched away almost any time. Mm -hmm. And I kind of look back and go, wow, there was been many, many, many opportunities to lift me off this mortal coil. And yet I stay. So I have to feel that the, the, those boys, I have, a, I have a duty to them and the family. I think it's fascinating, though, that instead, you know, some people would have stopped after a certain point with some of the things that you've been through, but you just kept going. So it does really show you weren't so much afraid of death. Well, you know, and to, to, that, to that point, um, so my last, well, my second to last film with Arnold was, uh, was uh, Eraser. And if you know anything about that movie or have seen anything about it, there is a scene on the on this big uh, overseas shipping container, thir a three ton overseas shipping container where it's being carried on a crane, gantry crane at, a, at the seaport over to a, a freighter where it's going to be dropped into the hold. And James Kahn is on the top there with a gun and Arnold's up there and Vanessa Williams. So there's a fight going on. Uh, so all that was done on green screen. And then for real, we were shooting that in San Pedro now. San Pedro is St. Peter. <laughs> ah, right. So there's a provenance in that, I guess. Um, <clears throat> so this scene now, we're, we're 100 feet up in the air. I'll use my phone for an illustration. We're, uh, we're 100 feet up in the air on top of this box. And what happens is Arnold takes uh, a crowbar and smashes the gears above, and the box is set to drop. So we are literally 100 feet in the air. We had wires on our backs on a harness. And when the box dropped, we would fall with it. Within 20 feet of the deck, the wire would pull us away and the container would smash. And all of that was shot from directly above us in another crane so they could actually see, and it would compress the distance in order to make it look like we'd actually gone to the ground with the box, right? Mm -hmm. um, so now what you have to do to make that work is you have to have these four cables that support the box all cut simultaneously in order for it to drop. Uh, that didn't happen. But the funny part of it was, was myself and the other two doubles, Vanessa's double and James Kahn's double, we all had this feeling when we were standing there of impending doom, right? We just all had a very bad feeling that something was going to go wrong. Now, you can't call, you know, a $250,000 stunt on a gut feeling or else you'll never work in Hollywood again. Mm -hmm. But I always say when you're dead, you won't work in Hollywood again either. 
<clears throat> so we kept asking the effects guys, you know, are you guys okay rigging this? How are you rigging it? And they were like, oh no, they were under stress. And they're like, go away, we're, we got this, you know, we're being pressured. And so <clears throat> when we got up there and they did the gag, what happened was all of those cables had to fire simultaneously in order for that box to drop. So it went bang, 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 click. So now you have three tons of steel, this angry box hanging by one partially severed cable and spinning on its axis. And I went by it on my cable and it hit me, uh, knocked me about 60 feet. I didn't, you know, I was expecting to see the ground looking down. Mm -hmm. And the next thing I know, I feel this like a freight train hit me in the side and on this shoulder. And then the next thing I know, I'm going straight at the warehouse wall, which was 60 feet away. I'm like, this isn't right. <laughs> something's not right about this and I as I reach the apex of the turn on the wire and turn back I see the box just sitting there whoosh, whoosh, spinning and there's nothing you can do you're just, you're just a dope on a rope at that point and it sucked up my cable and pulled me back in and I hit it again on this same side and spit me off and then I realized what was going on and so I as I got further out I threw this arm and leg across so that I kept going in on the same side Mm. But it broke everything on this side, broke collarbone, scapula, top three ribs, uh, fractured my ankle. Uh, and then it all finally came to rest. And of course, you know, there was screaming from the crew down below. Uh, and I was actually at that point, the box was hanging like this. And I was actually under, oops, sorry, <laughs> it's not working too well. I was actually underneath it. So I had this cable finally severed, it would have just pounded me into the ground like peanut butter. Oh, um, and so they came up on a gantry, on a um, man lift and put me in it. And I knew I had a lot of stuff broken, but the adrenaline was running so high, I wasn't sure what at that point. And they got me into the crane. We cut my cable. And I looked up, and Vanessa's double, who is uh, April Whedon White, who will probably watch this piece later. Uh, love you, hon. She, uh, she was hanging upside down in her harness, and I thought she was dead. And wow. so I was yelling at the guys to get me up there. And when we got up there, she was literally hanging backwards like this. And uh, I was I was trying to wake her up. And I'm like, come on, April, come on, wake up, wake up. And she came to with a scream and she'd had her hand crushed by my cable uh, and a, a pretty brutal concussion because she'd hit her head on the beam, the upright beam when the whole thing, the whole system jerked. Um, so we cut her cable and got her into the basket and they were bringing us down and I blacked out. Uh, and I woke up in being slid into the ambulance. Wow. Wow, that's harrowing. Amazing. Michael, did you want to add something? Yeah, um, just a question for Peter again. Having come so close to death, at least a couple of times in your case, does it really change the way that you look at life? You know, does it become more precious? Do you become more focused, more ambitious, um, more you know, live life and enjoy? But does it really change the way that you do look at the time that you have here? Oh, most, most certainly, most certainly. Um, you know, every, like I said, every day I wake up and I realize just how lucky I am to still be here. Um, and I kind of, you know, give her one of those. And, um, and, you know, and I look, I look at my boys and I realize that, uh, you know, the family is everything. Um, and at the same time, you know, you, as you get to a certain age, I'm 63 now. So I look at myself and I'm like, well, you know, you don't have a lot of time. Um, and I'm lucky to have the time that I have had. So I want to make the best out of what's left. So to the point of ambition, I guess so. Um, you know, I have a new career now. I'm, I'm a, a real estate agent, <laughs> something, something that doesn't give me too many stitches. I think I hope anyway, um, <laughs> So that, and uh, yeah, you know, I just, I feel like every day is a blessing and just get out there and do what you can and enjoy it. And, you know, you don't even know if you're going to wake up the next day. Now, did, did that also, because of your close encounters with death, did you get more curious about what death is? Is there an afterlife? Did you need anything connected? Theories about that. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, funny enough, you know, and it, it's interesting because even my boys right now, we were just watching a couple of series that was on Netflix talking about uh, after death and reincarnation and all of those things, you know. And funny enough, I'd always been kind of a student of the occult, if you want to call it that. Um, uh, I studied all kinds. I studied Christ Christology, theocracy, uh, all kinds of things back in the day. I used to have lengthy conversations with Paul Verhoeven, who was a, a legendary director and directed Total Recall. 
uh, because he was into uh, Christology quite heavily. So I, I've sort of, you know, run the gamut of all kinds of, of uh, esoterica, I guess, for want of a better word. Uh, Red Blavatsky and Alistair Crowley and Donald Dunglass Home and, you know, all of those things. Um, and so mediumship was a big interest to me. Even when I was younger, before I started stunts, I was, you know, quite into Edgar Cayce. Uh, and so um, to the point of, you know, uh, past lives, I think I, I went through regression once when I was younger and saw some interesting things. I don't exactly know how to define them 100 percent, but um, uh, the past lives regression I went through was brought, brought some interesting things into focus for me. Uh, one of which was uh, I remember lying face down in the dust and seeing blood splatter in the dust beside me and kind of a yellow robe like a sari I felt it was. Um, that was one of them. Another one was uh, being feeling very, very old and being rowed out on, a, on an old rowboat, probably in the 1700s or something towards a big sailing ship. Um, but anyway, to the point of, of you know, afterlife, um, yeah, I have the feeling that, you know, where we come here to go through this experience. Um, I kind of look at it as like, when you go on vacation, you take a bunch of photos, you come home and show them to your friends. So this life is that vacation, you die, you leave the body behind, and you go back to where you were and you say, you know, you recant or recount the story of what, uh, what your experience was like, what your vacation was like. And, you know, you get maybe the chance to come back and do it again, or maybe you go visit some other place. You know, I, I didn't know until recently that you really liked um, Madame Blavatsky. And there is a great biography by Gary Lockman. In fact, it, it's what got me really interested in her. It's, it's just a beautifully written book. And I thought of you because I thought maybe you had some connection to her literally because I don't know if you know this about her, but she she died like almost three times. The first time she was thrown from a horse and she went into a coma and it was like in 1864 and she was, I forget how long in this coma and evidently after she got, and they, they thought she was going to be dead and she was wasting away and she came out of it and she already had some powers, but her power is solidified. And then the other one that I found very almost humorous is she traveled in all around the world and she was in the Balkans and she got involved in a war. And so she was shot and um, I think also hit with a saber and thrown into a ditch. And again, they thought she was dead and she came out of that uh, alive and she still had the musket balls in her legs to prove it, you know. And I said, I wonder if you you were part of the theosophy group. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, had, I remember now that you recounted that story. It looks like my arms cut off there. Um, I, re, I remember now that you recounted that story. I, I remember the piece about the, the war and her being shot and the saber. Um, yeah, she, uh, I remember reading her and I was, it was a long time ago. I had to be 17, 18. You know, I, I used to, I would pick a book I would read the book and if it interested me, I would go through the back and look at the references and what other things they had taken some of the material from. Mm -hmm. And then I would start a list of that. And then I would read those and that it, it kind of became this branching, branching, branching effect. Um, so one thing would lead to another, to another, to another. And so I would come home with, I would go to the library and come home with literally a bag I could barely carry. Um, but Blavatsky blew me away because the depth of her knowledge like you read Isis Unveiled and you look at, you know, the amount of knowledge that she had and you're just, it, it's astounding. You, the book is, you know, this thick. Mm -hmm. And you think about some of the stuff she's purporting, uh, propounding there and, this, and what she's talking about. It's just like, how does one person have that vast amount of knowledge in, in their heads to be able to put all that down? Yeah, it, it really is phenomenal. And she had such an effect on so many people. And that's what uh, Gary Lockman in the beginning of his book says. He sort of discounted her until he realized so many people referred to her. And then when he dived into it, you know, he has a great admiration of her after he did the biography. But yeah. I, I didn't I didn't really realize what an interesting character she was. <laughs> you yeah, know, she really was like a daredevil in her own way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I would have liked to have met her. I would have liked to have been part of her crew, I think. There was some interesting folks that hung out there back in those days. It was an interesting time, that whole turn of the century. 
was really a, a lot of, uh, you know, guys like Crowley and uh, a lot of people. There was some really interesting characters that came out of all of that. Absolutely. I, I would love to be have, go back in time and, and see some of these people. There's just an unusual combination of, of people, I think, that just hasn't been in terms of at least the occult movement, in terms of the, the, the really creative and powerful and also influential, like Annie Horniman, who started Abbey Theatre, that they really contributed to society as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. I was, I was fascinated by Crowley as well, just because, you know, he seemed to be the ultimate bad man. Um, but I think, I think there was a lot of theatrics also involved in Crowley. Um, well, what's interesting about Crowley is the more you get to know him, the less bad he is. His yeah. reputation is, is whereas, you know, like, wait, the more you get to know him, you see his darker side. You know? So it, it's, the, the, it's, a, it's definitely a little exaggerated. He was very dramatic, Crowley. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh, and there's such, you know, they, some the legendary things like uh, apparently Jimmy Page owns his old castle in Scotland or used to on Bolskeen there. And, you know, you talk about, I think, was it Eliphaz Levi or whatever that they had? They were they had a spell casting war between the two of them. Oh, that was. Uh, well, I, don't, I know that William Yates had they had a battle like literally Yates. And, yeah. And I, I remember somebody uh, Crowley sent a spell or apparently something like that. And it killed all the horses in his in his barn. And uh, then light refused to penetrate the turret and the top of the castle where Crowley used to sit at night like. You know, so I don't know how much truth there is to that stuff. But when you were reading that as like a 17, 18 year old, you're like, whoa, that's some, <laughs> that's some serious stuff. Yeah, he, he definitely was a real character, too. You really. know, and, and reading those things led me down the road to reading things like Malleus Maleficarum, the Hammer of the Witches and uh, and uh, the Nag Hammadi uh, and the greater and the lesser key of Solomon. Not so good. The Goetia, um, you know. I think I got myself into some trouble with the Goetia. Really? Did you summon a demon that was not a good uh, situation for you? I don't know if I summoned one, but I think there was some dark energy that I, I managed to bring out of there just by, you know, tinkering around with it and drawing symbols from it and stuff like that. Yeah, it's, that, not, it's not something that you should meddle with. Put it it, it does way, seem folks. like you should go in knowing at least something or having a mentor or, or just because it's powerful more than anything else. Yeah, yeah. And... Yeah. But I, yeah. I think a lot of people I, I didn't. Tinker. I was just like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> so um so what what are your real what are your views about, you know, the afterlife as far as do you, you it sounds like you believe in reincarnation and uh I do. I I think so. Um and it's an interesting kind of juxtapose because, you know, I have read stories and heard them from as far back as I can remember. You know, in India, a young boy born to a family, uh, as he gets to be three or four years old, recounts his previous family in a, vi in a village so far away that uh, he couldn't walk there in two or three days, remembers his parents, remembers his aunts and his uncles and all of that, people who he couldn't possibly know. And, you know, the parents, his existing parents, take him back there finally, and he recounts the whole story of who he was and, and knows everything about everybody. And, you know, those, there are many, many cases of that. There's not just one or two, there's thousands and maybe more. So to dispel that would be foolish um, because those cases are, they, they're verified by people who are actually there. Um, so you have to put some credence to that. Um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. I, 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 I don't know exactly, you know, no one does really what the, what the parameters are for reincarnation, um, whether, and whether you get to choose to come back again or, or it's thrust upon you, I don't really know. Um, but I think that there's a certain aspect of it that you, know, you have a certain, um, how do I say this, a certain checklist maybe of things that you have to do and go through um, before you're free to not return, put it that way. So, uh are you familiar with like the Tibetan Book of the Dead? I am. Yes, I read it. Yeah. And the Egyptian as well. So it, it, it seems like the Tibetan Buddhists, from my experience, and I'm not an expert, but I, I've been involved in it, is, is they have studied through their own methods um, 
certain aspects of death. For instance, you know, in, in the, the full version of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, they know if someone's ill, the stages, physiological stages of when they're going to die by physical things. So they, they've observed. And it seems to me, you know, I, again, maybe you can't verify it, but that this concept of when you go into the bardo that you're supposed to go to the brightest light. Right. Um, it's an interesting idea to me that, and, and, and I guess I would kind of trust them because in a lot of ways they seem to be very studious about watching the mind and mm -hmm. trying to verify it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, I, I know what you're speaking of where they, where they literally tried to keep those who were dying uh, in a conscious enough state that they could recount what they were seeing or what they were going through uh, in order to document that. And they have gone through thousands and thousands of cases, probably more than that even, to create that book. And, you know, then compiling all the similarities and the dissimilarities and all of that. So, yeah, um, it was, it's a fascinating book. It is, and it's, it's a little daunting. The first time I read it and they get, you get to the wrathful deity stage and it says at one point, you know, when you see these, you know, wrathful looking figures, do not be afraid. I'm like, well, I'm probably going to be afraid. <laughs> and yeah. they make it sound like, hey, it's going to be no big deal. <laughs> yeah. They're your friends. Okay. <laughs> your friends. The monsters are more popular in, in our culture than when I was growing up. Like, they're kind of cool. Yeah. Well, the, the funny thing is, it's, you know, there are so many cultures, uh, the Eastern cultures and, you know, the European cultures that, that are adamant that there is an afterlife and adamant that there is reincarnation. And then you look in the westernized uh, society and how they view reincarnation. And it seems to be an anomaly, really. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like, well, that can't be possible. Oh, hell no. You know, that's that, no, 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 you're crazy. Uh, and yet, if you look at the rest of the world, basically outside of Western civilization, it's a, it's a fair, fairly foundational belief. That's a really good point. And, and I think, you know, you brought up Edgar Cayce because uh, my father also was really into Edgar Cayce. And he was my first sort of like um, person I read in my spiritual path, too. And, and the fact that he was such a religious Baptist, I think. And, and then when he started having the readings about reincarnation, at first he couldn't really fathom it himself. But the fact that he, he himself got over that, even with that upbringing and believed in reincarnation, is really kind of phenomenal if you think about it. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah that was one of my first reads, I think. It was one of the very first things that drew me into the whole concept was Casey's books. Mm -hmm. I think my dad actually had a copy of it and I found it on his shelf because I saw The Sleeping Prophet and picked it up and started reading that. And I think that was literally one of my first exposures. Yeah, it definitely was mine too. And my, my dad was always, he'd been fascinated with Casey before I started reading it. And he always, and he actually studied him a lot more than I did. But, um, <laughs> What would you, I'm wondering though, um, this is a little bit different question. Um, if somebody is like really afraid of dying and death, what, what would, advice would you give them having, you know, really gone through, a, you know, a close encounters like you have? Um, well, I, t I can take that from a personal aspect because um, my dad, <clears throat> he had cancer um, and he had managed to kind of keep it at bay for quite a while. It was probably almost 18 years before you know, it finally got him. Um, but he was quite afraid of dying. And I remember having a conversation with him once and he was like, you know, we were talking about it. And I said to him, you know, I'm, I, and I, you know, told him I had been through my accident at that point and a few other things. So I really didn't have a fear of it. And I kind of had an idea similar to what I have now about what I believe. And I tried to impart some of that to him. And, you know, and he said, he goes, I, I'm glad that you have that belief and I'm glad that you're comfortable with it, but I don't. And so, I, and, and thus I'm afraid. And I just tried to tell him, I said, you know, I, I understand that you're afraid, let, but you know, it, you don't, you shouldn't be. And it was a weird place to be, to be advising your dad, you know, um, I felt strange, but at the same time, I, I think I offered him a little bit of comfort. I hope. Wow, I didn't know that happened. That's that is really that's very touching. Yeah, and I lost him when we were shooting Total Recall. I was in Mexico City, um, filming, and I was actually in the hotel room. And his girlfriend called me. And he was at seventy six at that point, and uh, his girlfriend called me because I'd been trying to reach him because I was flying home for his birthday at the end of the movie, and it was we we're probably four days away from finishing filming, and uh, I couldn't get an answer on the phone. 
And then his girlfriend called me and said he didn't want you to know, but he's in the hospital. And then she called me back about 45 minutes later and said he would passed away. So, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a good moment for me. But, you know, it is what it is, right? There's no per, there's no perfect time or perfect place or perfect situation for it. No, I, you know, I think that sometimes I think the movies do a disservice for death. Because when my grandmother was dying, I was really always at the hospital with her almost always every day. And then when she, you know, I wanted to be there when she was actually dying at that moment. And I think I went away for just a little while and she died during that time. And I'd literally been two weeks like with her and I, I there was nothing I could do about that. You know, that was her choice in a way or that was what was going to happen. And I had a similar experience with my mom. Uh, you know, she'd had a stroke and then two years later had another one uh, with a brain bleed. And so they, you know, by the time I got to her uh, and I lived, I lived a ferry ride away from where she was. Um, she was already in the hospital and this was over Christmas. And, you know, I, she was barely conscious. She was in a coma. And so at first, when I first got to see her, she was responsive to some degree. Um, but that quickly faded because of the blame, the brain bleed. And, you know, I knew she was terminal, but she hung on. Um, I had to take her off of lights. I had to take her off of IV even, uh, because she didn't want any life support of any kind. And I was looking at the drip in her arm and I thought, well, that is in fact sort of, uh, you know, keeping you going. So I had to sit beside her and tell her that. And even though she was not reactive to me, she squeezed my hand when I said, you know, what's going to happen if I have to take this out. Right. And I, that was, that kind of blew me away. It was one of the most difficult things I had to ever, I've ever had to do. Um, and then of course I, I got called, I was in the process of starting a TV series that I produced and was able to direct and, and host and all of that. Uh, and I got called away to a meeting in Vancouver. And as soon as I got on the ferry and got back home, she passed away. Yes, so I, wasn't, I wasn't there for it. So, well, you, you, you were you were there near her, though. That's how I, I think with my grandmother. I, I just found it kind of peculiar, you know, more. And, and I it, it happens more with people. I've heard other people say that they literally just go out the room for a coffee and the person dies. I mean, it can be that quick. And yeah. um, so maybe there's some reason for that. Maybe it's easier for the person to leave at that point. I'm not quite sure. It could be. Yeah. My wife is a nurse and she deals with a lot of people who are, you know, palliative and uh, even her grandmother who was living here with us uh, briefly towards the end. Um, we were lucky to have that happen here and then that uh, she was able to, you know, have a, have a last meal with us and the, say goodbye to the family and the boys and everything. And she was a hundred years old. She had taken a bad fall, but uh, yeah. Wow. That was an ideal situation. I mean, if you have to look at the uh, uh, best way to go, I think that would be it. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, she was a she was a powerful old, old lady. That one, um, well loved by everybody in the family. So we know she's still out there somewhere, aren't you, Gran? Now, do you feel you have any like a connection to your mother's spirit or your father's spirit? Oh boy. Okay, so. Um, yeah, my mom's, I think, has appeared a few times. Not that I've seen, but I've felt. Um, but one that was really amazing was, uh, you know, my dad died in 1989 in Mexico, and I, so I felt a lot of unresolved issues. Um, and uh, I was in my um, bedroom in my apartment, and uh, my, my wife, uh, then girlfriend, said, uh, there feels like somebody in the room. And I sat up and all of a sudden this shape, and the room was black, pitch black, but yet there was this shape and the outline of the shoulders and the top of the head was all in gold. And it wasn't a definable gold. It, looks like, it looked like something like just gold glitter, but ethereal, not, not, you know, not material. Um, and it was just kind of like this very low lux, very low light sparkle around a, a human form and only the upper part of the body, but it was my dad, I knew it. And, um, and I think it was sort of just to resolve the fact that I hadn't had the chance to say goodbye. And the funny part of it was I, I knew who it was and I said, you know, hi dad. And, and uh, I put my hand out and all of a sudden I felt like, you know when you fill a sink with water 
-hmm. and you put your hand in the sink, that pressure, mm -hmm. about that much pressure on my hand, like someone had taken my hand. Wow. And then, and then it just dissipated and was gone. Wow, and I know for a fact what I saw, I wasn't sleeping. Uh, my wife was there. She saw it too, I think. So, uh, you know, it was one of those things that was just like, I believe it was like sort of a way to resolve and give me closure on the fact that I wasn't there with them when I was, when I wanted to be in, you know, so it was pretty amazing. That, that's a, that is amazing. I've never heard anything like the, the gold description. That's you know, really cool. I, I, I don't know how to describe it to you because I, I have never seen it before and I have never seen it since, but if, and it was, it was not like a, a hard tangible outline but it was enough that it looked like it was surrounding a human form like sort of like this gold very very soft gold light being shown down from above that's all i can tell you wow i love that yeah and it was wild because the the, the pressure thing on my hand I, I, that, I that's the only way i can describe it was just it felt like when you the amount of pressure you get putting your hand in a sink full of water and then it was just gone it just vanished so I think I was pretty lucky. You know, Steiner has a book, Staying Connected, that a friend of ours, Julie, right. recommended. Um, and he really believes that we're meant to stay connected to our family members that pass, that that's part of the evolution of mankind. The And it, and it benefits them. And he goes into specific ways that we benefit the dead and they benefit us. So what do you think about that concept? Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard that before. I don't know if I've heard Steiner's version of it, but I have heard, you know, the concept of um, families staying together and incarnating together again. And I, you know, I think the Japanese certainly have a sense of that when they talk about honoring the ancestors and the First Nations too as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that concept is sort of in, ingrained in their culture, that uh, the knowledge that your family sticks with you and in fact, you know, your mother who passed away could come back as your child. Um, I think there's a lot of belief in that. I have, I have even have a friend right now who, um, whose brother recently passed away. And within, I think, a day or two, he found out that his wife was pregnant. Mm -hmm. And he firmly believes that that's his brother coming back. And, you know, I, I wouldn't take that away from him in the least. I mean, who's to say, right? But he has that, he believes it quite adamantly. So I hope he's right. I hope he gets some proof of that. I guess it's a good thing if you like the family member and it can be very challenging <laughs> <laughs> when you have some uh, difficult family relations. Yeah. I hear from yeah. some of my clients, you know, some of the relationships that people have are not always pleasant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't want that one reincarnated again, no. Don't At least come maybe, back. maybe a couple centuries in between yeah. or something. Yeah, give me a break, will you? <laughs> Get, get out. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, is there anything else that you would like to talk about in terms of the whole idea of cheating death? We're getting a little, we're about seven minutes left and, and your, you know, your thoughts about if this is really something that anyone can have happen or are we, do we have faded deaths? Do we have choices and crossroads where we might be able to leave. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, a, a fated death. It's funny, you know, you, when you think about that. So here's a guy like myself who probably should have been dead 10 times over, at least that I know of. And then probably how many more that I don't know of. And then you have some young kid who dies of cancer at five or even as a baby um, and trying to wrap your head around that and justify it in some way. When I look at, you know, I, I hear about people who's, died at 30 or whatever, you know, any, any age. <clears throat> and so you try to put some sense to it really. And to figure out how, you know, in your mind, what makes that right? How does that, how can that be right? How does it work? So I, and I don't know, you know, I mean, you, you could have an, a, you can have almost any belief as to whether somebody, somebody's death is fated or not. Um, and there certainly are some circumstances where things have happened that, you know, what what is the what were the chances of that happening? I remember reading somewhere where a guy was on vacation in Italy and a pig fell off of a patio uh, on a building 
you know, above the street that somebody <laughs> who keeps a pig on their patio first. Right. And, you know, here's the guy appearing before St. Peter. In the He's like, why are you here? Well, you're not going to buy this one, but it was a pig. Okay. <laughs> there are some so, strange ways know. to die. Um, so, to, you know, to that, but I mean, I, and as far as me going, I, you know, I just, as I say, I'm just blessed to be here every day. Um, I, I know what, I know what I've, what I've missed. And uh, I, I think about it, you know, every morning, just happy to wake up because you never know if you're going to get another one. And I think that applies to everybody, really. You sh- you've got it. You should really, whether you think that way or not, you should, because, you know, anything can happen. Even I totally agree with in the that. Middle of the night or uh, uh, one of uh, Elon Musk's uh, <laughs> satellites come down and land on your house. We had, Michael, on one of his birthdays, we had the strangest accident. We were at um, a pub, uh, the Irish pub, I forget the name of it, Finn McCool's, but it's been sold now. And we were sitting there having fish and chips in the middle of the day, and a car crashed into the side of the building. I remember that. It happened so fast that I didn't even know what was happening. I just saw... um, our friend yelling and I, and I saw kind of the glass and I was like in this kind of weird bubble, like what's going on. (laughs) And, and and then it was like over and then, you know, everybody turned out to be okay, but it was so dramatic and, and it was just nuts, you know, and it happened in such a You know what's funny about that is when you're, you're saying like, it seemed to be in slow motion to a degree. Yeah. And I remember that when I got hit with the shipping container, not only did it go into, and it's a hard thing to even describe, but, not only was it in slow motion, it seemed to be hyper fast. And I don't know how to really uh, align those two in a statement that I thought like that, that I just made. But, but for me, it seemed to take forever. And at the same time, it seemed to be over in a tenth of a second. Actually, that's a perfect description of it, because I, w- I totally agree with you, because it, it, de- it was slow enough that I could see it, but it happened so fast that I couldn't process it. Like, my yeah. body was not even maybe, sure what was Maybe going that's on. the brain's way of, of, of processing it. Right. It's attempting to slow it down or, or whatever, I don't know. But I can still remember that from, from uh, that accident, and, and just I still think back about it, and I can, I can see it, and it's almost like shutter, the shutter going off, you know, click, 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 click. Yeah, it, it's and I think accidents are particularly strange because because they do see I mean they come out of the blue that's why they're called accidents and yeah. I mean most of the time you you don't even this one we definitely didn't see coming. Uh, Michael, you had a comment. Yeah, and just a funny uh, comment on that that accident that happened and the car crashed into the wall and of course you know all the glass went flying and it was a huge bang and everything and the, the Irish waitress says ah oh, she said that reminds me of home it sounded just like when the IRA bombs used to go off. <laughs> 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 yeah, it was loud. Yeah. But it, it was, it was, and then afterwards, I think we were all a little shook up, but it, you know, we'd survived it. We had like, you know, it was like over. So yeah. I suppose maybe the way one dies can also affect us. Like if I know if I have a terminal illness versus I die in, a, in an accident, um, yeah, it has a different effect on us. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, it, it, it's, <clears throat> you know, What's what's the line? Um, tra- tra- I'm trying to think. Shuffles off this mortal coil. Travels to the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. Puzzles the will and makes us bear those ills we have rather than fly to those we know not of. Uh, the Shakespeare line. Mm. You know, the, who's, bo- who's born, meaning the border. Whose border we know not of. We don't, we don't know what's on the other side. And nobody's ever come back to tell us. That we know of anyway i mean you, you you look though i found uh the show we were watching the other night taught with mediums that were you know talking with people who had passed and spirits and channeling that my boys found it fascinating and i, I had always found it fascinating when i was uh, you know younger and still do really because you wonder you know are, are these people for real are they charlatans or is it really something that's happening i think it's a mix of both I yeah. personally believe there's definitely some connection to the other world that some people have. Yes. Uh, and uh, but each of us have to explore it and experience it for ourselves in the long run. That's for sure. So we're winding up. Thank you so much, Peter, for coming on the show. It was really a lot of fun. You're welcome. I, it was it was great. Let's not wait another thirty years to do it again. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Okay. Thanks, All right. guys. All right. Take care. 
Cheers. thank you all for watching. We look forward to next week when we continue to explore the esoteric and the obscure together. Have a great week.